Hey everybody, welcome to this week's Q&As. No special announcements or anything, so let's jump right in. First up, over on Patreon, Explode Processing says they've been building an AV rack over time for retro consoles, including analog consoles, and they call it the Tower of Doom. They think it's a rock-solid solution and compact, but the one improvement they want to make is they'd like to convert or mount things like the OSSC, RetroTINK 5X, or 4K as well, into rack-mounted components. So extend RCAs, HDMIs, and SCART to its own streamlined section to keep the device secure and reduce wear and tear and moving them around. Any thoughts on this? Yeah, here's how I did that in the past in uh, non-retro environments, but same exact thing. So modernized components that didn't have rack mount options, etc. All I would do is get a cheap um, rack shelf. So whatever thin metal thing was available for the absolute cheapest on Amazon or eBay. And it's ridiculous because some of those are like 100 bucks for a shelf and it's a bent piece of metal with holes in it. I, it's just mind blowing. And you know, the cheap piece of metal that you get for 10 bucks is usually the exact same thing. Maybe it's not powder coated or something, but whatever, you could spray it yourself if you want. So get that. Then look and kind of take your components and place them out on it and mark with a magic marker where the screw holes are and then drill holes into the metal and then replace the screws of whatever it is that you're using and go up through the bottom. So that mounts them in pretty securely. With stuff like the OSSC and the RetroTINK 5X, they've got, you know, not, there are not metal cases. So you just have to be very aware of that. Don't tighten them down too much. You don't want to squish the plastic. But that's definitely how I've done stuff with other components. And if there's heat issues, I just add feet or washers to the mix. Um, I like to get those uh, rubber feet from Amazon that already have, uh, they're like glue to some kind of metal washer and they're they're pretty deep so that you could fit a screw in there and not worry about the screw head scraping whatever you've got but I you could use those in this situation as well you could probably use two if you want just slap them together or something if heat was an issue that way you could raise the component just enough up off of the piece of metal so that there's some air movement underneath it's not going to be as good as a fan but whatever if heat is an issue, you could always take the cases off of these devices and do the same thing with washers, nuts, and bolts. That's a little iffy, though, because I don't know if you're going to want all of this stuff exposed. But that's definitely a trick I've done before in computers and even home audio stuff, whereas you just take at least the top of the case, or sometimes, depending on the component, the whole case off, mount it onto the rack, and then you could close the rack door, and whatever airflow is in there is going to work twice as good because there isn't an enclosure around the piece of uh, electronics components. So I would think about all of those things. I'd also love to hear anybody's opinion in the chat. Is any of those a very bad mistake? Um, as long as you make sure that the PCBs aren't touching or have no possibility to flex and touch the, the metal shelf, I can't imagine there would be. I guess the only scenario would be if there's a component that has specific airflow designed around the case. But I don't think that's a thing in retro. So uh, yeah, I think generally speaking, even stuff with fans probably would be fine taking the case off and just cooling it elsewhere. But yeah, that's my thoughts on that. So let me know your thoughts. Um, maybe I made a mistake in that one. Maybe there's a better way to do it, but that's certainly how I've done it over the years. And you could get ghetto. You could take lighter components and put double-sided tape on it. The good industrial 3M stuff, not like scotch tape you get at the store. But the only problem with that, the components themselves might be fine, but then when you're plugging all of these wires into them, that strain relief is going to pull on that and it might back the tape out over time. But yeah, I'd love to hear any of uh, anybody else's ideas as well. Next up, Demon Koo said, with the RetroTINK 4K coming out and including downscaling, they're having a hard time figuring out how to route this downscaling feature through their entire setup elegantly without changing cables when needed. Doesn't seem like it could work for most of these mega gaming setups, but they were wondering if I had heard of anyone doing this. Yeah, you're probably going to need a combination of a matrix switch and at the very least an HDMI splitter or distribution amp. Now, Demon Koo has an Extron crosspoint in this setup already, so you're already halfway done. You really would just need to decide what you want to do on the HDMI output side. I did take a look at your flow chart. That looked very complicated. Uh, well done. That's an awesome setup. So you just need to decide how you want to route things. In a perfect world, you would get an HDMI matrix switch. You would replace your main switch with one of these. And in a perfect world, it would be... 12 in, 6 out, or something like that, or 20 in, 6 out, and that way you can go to all of your displays, but you could also do things like route back into 
the RetroTINK 4K, so any of your other HDMI devices can go through this, then back into the TINK's HDMI input. But on the output side of things, you could then do stuff like send multiple to multiple displays as you have in your setup, but also send one to a digital to analog converter and route that back through the cross point. Now, I haven't been able to find good matrix HDMI switches that support at least up to 4K60. 4K120 would be nice, but that would probably be the use case for most of us, especially if you're doing something like sending a Blu-ray player or streaming box directly to your TV, but also want to route it through the tank and you want to separate Dolby Atmos. But you probably could do that with a basic HDMI switch and a couple of splitters and distribution amps. So you could have your main HDMI switch, um, and then you could have uh, probably a one to four distribution amp on the output side. And then after coming out of the Tink 4K, you could have the distribution amp there as well, so that one output of the Tink could go to four devices or whatever. So you're going to have to think about that. If anybody finds a cheap, I don't want to look at $2,000 options, under $200 HDMI matrix that could do all this, please let me know. I found 4x4s for 130 which I guess I'm about to buy before the Tink 4 k is launched just to give somebody or give people an idea of what to expect. But I wish there were more inputs. Of course, I could take an eight port HDMI switch and plug it into one of the four on that, but I'm just saying. Um, but after that, after you've got multiple outputs, then you just rely on your cross point. So let's just say, you know, you're uh, one of your many displays in your setup, you could use as a test display. It'll, let's just say it accepts every signal, 240p all the way up. Even if it looks terrible in 240p, it accepts it. So you fire up that monitor, you fire up your Tink 4K, you get your console loaded into it, and then you go into your profiles, and let's say you've saved a profile for downscaling switch, let's just say. You load up that profile, and you can see it on the monitor. It probably looks like crap, but that's your, you know, your display monitor here. And then after that, you could switch the Xtron cross point to take the digital to analog converter coming out of the tink and go to your RGB monitors. So it all comes into matrix switching and rerouting. I probably just word vomited for three minutes and made things more confusing. So I guess the short version is you need a matrix switch on the analog side, which you already have an Xtron cross point, and a big matrix switch on the HDMI side would work, or one switch with two different distribution amps to figure out how to route things in, uh, in different ways. So let me know if I made that more confusing or if I was able to point you in the right direction. Next up, 60FPS wanted to point out that I once again mispronounced Rich Whitehouse's name in the previous roundup. Um, Rich is the person who did the big PMU emu, the Atari Jaguar emulator. And yeah, I, I do it on purpose all the time. I don't know Rich that well, but he seems like he has a similar silly sense of humor. And the dude's suffering through cancer. So, you know, let me, let me mess with him a little bit and try to make him laugh. Or what's the worst thing that happens? He gets mad and then he gets to spend time being mad at me for a few minutes rather than being sick with cancer. I'll take both. I'd much rather have him laugh. But yeah, I, I don't know for a fact if he even finds this remotely amusing, but I have a feeling it makes him chuckle. And I'm going to continue to say his name wrong until he tells me not to. Next up, Dustin Madison wants to know, if I were going to show someone around New York City for their first time, no matter the price, what are my top three essential tastes of New York that is a must for a visitor? This is hypothetical. It's an international city, but there's always things that New Yorkers say is totally a thing you could only get there. Well, walking around the touristy parts and uh, walking between them are, are definitely things that I would always suggest, and that's completely free. Uh, if you wanted to spend a day walking, you could walk around Times Square, walk to Rockefeller Center, walk to Central Park, walk over to um, Lincoln Center, and you could see a lot of cool stuff. And it's that areas that I'm talking about are all very safe and you could spend a day just doing that and kind of seeing stuff. One of my favorite restaurants was in Lincoln Center, but I think it closed, so I don't even want to say it. But it was a, a fancy French restaurant, and uh, if you went at the right times or if you're willing to like sit at the, the weird bar thingy and back, you could get a table, and especially during restaurant week, you can get really expensive meals for very fair prices. And that is um, one of the things about New York. If you know anybody that's currently living there or currently frequenting, ask them for their restaurant recommendations. Because a very common thing was we would, my wife, my wife and I would walk around and 
try to find different restaurants. And sometimes there would be a very fancy place and we'd end up spending way more than we wanted to on a perfectly fine meal. And then a week later, we'd walk around and find a place that wasn't quite as fancy and the prices were half the price, but the meal was so much better in every way. So ask around. Sometimes you pay for ambiance and sometimes you pay for good meals and it's nice to know which is which. Uh, the Circle Line Boat Tour is one that I always recommend. It's not expensive. It's kind of uh, cheesy in a way, but it's a really good way to see the city from a different perspective because you basically just get on a boat and you go around. And you could get uh, do the one that uh, loops so you could at least see the Statue of Liberty. That's kind of a neat thing to see. You could go to the Statue of Liberty, but there's a lot of standing in line and there's a lot of security checks. And I went with Super G once and three security checks in they kept beeping me in like when they waved in front of my pants and i could not stop laughing and i was like dude i've been through three different security checks now this is there's nothing in my pants and he's, he's i took off my belt i was like do you really want me to take my pants off the guy's like just, just go just go <laughs> so yeah there's a lot of standing in the first for a lot of stuff like that um the top of uh, any of the bigger buildings, you know, top of the rock, Rockefeller Center, top of the Empire State Building are awesome, but that's another very long line to wait in. So you really just have to decide. But for me personally, walking around the city and kind of just experiencing that way is going to be one of the most important things you could do there because you just get a you get a sense of how it's definitely different. Um, you know, it's not wildly different. You're not landing on an alien planet, but you you'll get a feel for it. So walk around that. The Nintendo store is in Rockefeller Center, and that's kind of neat to walk around and see. Everybody seems to like it. I usually get bored of it after the first time I went, but I brought all of my friends there and they all appreciated it. And then of course, if you're a retro gamer, you know, hit up JL, hit up Video Games New York, and then head out to Arcade Brooklyn. And if you're in the city for a couple of days, see if they have any events that week. And if there's any that matches your taste in games, that would be the time to go. Because it's an easy subway ride from Manhattan. And then you get to experience all of the craziness of the tournaments, and the arcade downstairs, and then you could just hop right on the subway back. So that's kind of like my 10 foot view. Walk around, take one of the Circle Line boat tours, um, try to find restaurants that are currently doing what you needed to be fancy feeling or just the, the best food you can get uh, and try some of the street food so if uh, I love halal food and you can't get it anywhere else in the country the way you get it in New York City I think the reason is just uh, quantity so they bring their trucks out and you know around 10 11 in the morning and they start cooking and they don't really stop until like 5 36 at night so the amount of stuff they're doing the amount of stuff they're cooking you're always getting fresh meat and you're, it's always you know, it's just always going through, you know, their pans are always using. So I think that's one of the main reasons why it never tastes the same. And also anybody who does this, you know, something similar all day long, every day is going to be really good at that after a couple of years. So you have a chef working at, out of a halal cart in the city for a year, they're going to be a halal freaking master. And then you go out to the burbs and try to get the same food and it's fine. So yeah, those are my, my current recommendations. I'm positive I forgot a whole bunch of different things, but that's definitely what I would say, you know, the top things. Walk around, take a boat tour, and uh, try some very awesome food. Next up, Adam wants to know how they should go about converting HDMI to composite. Their use case is watching media that's widescreen on a 4x3 TV that doesn't have a widescreen mode. All of their videos fill the screen, but are stretched out. Latency isn't an issue here since they're just watching media using Plex, but Plex doesn't have a 4x3 mode. And all of the converters they find are cheap and have no video modes, so they're really looking for one that has some kind of widescreen mode. Their TVs also supports component video if that matters, but they prefer not to use it because they don't think it would make a difference here. So I did a stream a while back with uh, Lewis from Zez Retro, and I'll leave a link to the write-up for it as well as the stream. The write-up's basically the short version of it, um, and then the stream you could kind of see it all in action, but you're probably looking for an Xtron VSC, probably a VSC 500 or 700. Links are all on that page. And that would allow you, you'd have to also convert HDMI to VGA first, but that's any cheap HDMI to VGA converter. And then that will downscale it. And it won't add too much latency. So you should be able to game if you wanted, 
But the Xtron box absolutely does have centering and size controls. So you can dial in a 16 by nine image. So that's absolutely what I would recommend. You should still be able to find them cheap. Um, I'll look right now as I'm talking, hopefully there's one in stock for you at least, but that's the, yeah, there's a few of them here and they're, they're ranging between 50 and 200 bucks, depending on what it comes with and stuff like that. So that's what I would suggest that should solve your problem. And if there's anything else that you need to know, definitely uh, let me know, but check out that live stream first, because I know it's kind of long, but we go through everything that you might run into. Um, that's one, one of the many reasons why I love running into problems in live streams, because that's the same problem most people would run into, and it should be able to uh, get you exactly what you need to do. So hopefully that'll, that'll be your solution, but let me know if it's not. Next up, Tony Escobar wants to know if RetroNAS will be updated to accommodate the new Mega Drive Genesis core for the Mister. The previous one required ROMs to be placed in the Genesis folder, but the new one requires them to be placed in a Mega Drive folder. I just messaged the team. Hopefully that's something they could add pretty quickly. If you need to work on that in the short term, I believe you can just search for the ROM and then back out using Mister's file browser, which is annoying, but it's at least a fix that's easy enough. And you could also create your own sim links if you use Linux or if you use programs like WinSCP. So if you need something in the short term, at least it's still usable. But I did just message the crew, and hopefully that's something that you could just update RetroNAS. And I think you would just have to reinstall the Mr. plugin, which wouldn't ruin anything. It wouldn't change anything. It would just re-update that. But I'll check with the team and see, and hopefully that's something that they could do. But, uh, it doesn't seem very hard, so that should be something they could probably get done within a week. Next up, Dan Bailey said that when watching the Sega Master System livestream I had recently done with Stika, at around the 34 minute 40 second mark, I had mentioned cartridge converters. And I had previously owned two of these. I had owned one that allowed me to play US games and the EverDrive on an MK2000 that plugged into the top. And while it definitely did work with original US uh, and Brazilian and European cartridges, it, the purpose that I had was really to use it with the EverDrive. And it was tall and it was kind of ugly and it stuck up really high, but it definitely worked and it was just plug and play, no mod required. I also had a converter that plugged into the rear of the MK2000 that did require a plastic cut, unfortunately, but I was able to just leave my EverDrive plugged into that. And then it kind of looked like I had just an MK2000 sitting on the shelf without a cartridge in it, but when I powered it on, it booted to the EverDrive because it was nicely hidden in back. I really wish somebody would uh, revisit that one because maybe there's a way to do it without cutting or maybe there's a way to do it so that you could, you'd could you have to unbolt the console and take the motherboard out, feed the piece of plastic or feed the converter through the plastic shell, plug it into the motherboard and then bolt it all down. And while that sounds like a pain, you don't ever need to remove it for any reason. So just doing that once and not having to cut a console and allowing you to play US games or at least leave an EverDrive plugged in, I think that would be pretty cool. There is one more EverDrive converter thingy in the works, but there's no info on a release date. I do hope it's soon because I would love to do another stream kind of messing around with that one. Um, but on the flip side, I have never seen a converter that allows you to use an MK2000 game on a US master system. Maybe they exist, but that's just not something that I had ever run into. So does anybody in uh, who's listening who might be able to post in the chat have any ideas? Uh, if not, ask over on SMS Power. They're all experts on the master system, but I've never done that. I've never put a Japanese game in a US master system, only the reverse to it. So hopefully somebody could find some info, but if not, at the very least, I'll leave a link to the master system page where you could get the other converters for it. Next up, Yepo is about to buy a couple of SCART cables. First, they're looking to buy a SCART to SCART cable, and they found ones from the brand Cable Direct and another from the brand CDL. CDL seems to be less known, but doing some research, they see the description says separate shielding, while Cable Direct says multiple shielding. I'm not really sure why they call it that, but Cable Direct are not fully shielded cables. They're cheap, so they're, they're pretty good if you need a spare or if you ordered one from one of the known cable makers and you know you need something in the short term, you could buy one of those and then throw it in your toolbox for later. But while each line has a signal and ground, they're not signal with the ground shielded over with. They're almost like twisted pair. Not quite, but sorta. So they're not bad cables, but they're absolutely not fully shielded cables. 
I don't know if CDL's description of separate shielding means that each co uh, conductor on the inside is actually shielded. You would have to buy it, open it up, and take a look at it. You might even have to cut the cable, and you could probably resolder it as well, but you might have to open it and cut it up to really see. I've never tested one of those, but if you are on a budget and you want to test stuff like that, absolutely do it. But if you just want to buy a cable and be done with it, just go to Retro Gaming Cables. I'm assuming you're in France because you're sending me links to the Amazon FR. Retro Gaming Cables is the UK, which is like one short swim away. So I would absolutely just buy the correct cables. Uh, I'll leave links. I think there's a 0.5 meter and a 1.5 meter version. So just buy whatever length matches and go from there. And that way you don't have to worry. They're fully shielded. There's a video I'm about to show coming up that's going to show this cable in it. And I specifically use that cable to run some tests to prove that they're fully shielded and working well. So I would just kind of do that. You also mentioned a Wii to SCART cable, and if you are already using a PAL Wii, you could do that, but I don't think that you could get 480p through that unless you do some kind of soft modding, which, you know, isn't too hard. I think most people probably have soft modded Wiis, but it's the same thing. You could get a cheap cable off of Amazon and hope that it's shielded and not a piece of crap, or you could just buy a known good one from retro gaming cables. So... On the Wii side of things, I would try to figure out your final solution. You mentioned that through the OSSC. So uh, I think that would be, as long as you could run 480p through it, I think that's a good solution. You could just get a component video cable uh, and same deal, get a Nintendo branded or an HD retrovision cable and go from there into the OSSC. And what do I think of that versus the Wii to HDMI dongle? The Wii to HDMI is excellent, well, as long as you get the good one from... Uh, from Electron Shepard and not any of the junky ones for five bucks on AliExpress. Um, but you're only going to output whatever native resolution is being sent. So 480p max. Whereas if you run a good shielded analog cable through the OSSC, you could get 960p. So you could, you know, you, know, you could, and you could de interlace 480i and not just send interlaced video to your TV. So that's definitely going to be a better solution, but you're going to want to spend money on a good cable. Buying a cheap, unshielded cable going through the OSSC, you might get higher resolution, but all you're going to do is also scale the interference and the noise that you're getting. Um, if you have a Wii to HDMI that you got from AliExpress, I, I would save that as a tool in your toolbox because you probably only spent five bucks on it. It's just a good thing. It's a good, you know, it's a fair price for what you get. But I would go with a shielded cable option. If you're talking about the one from Electron Shepard, that's different. It's a little more expensive, but that one's well built and you're not going to get any interference. So you're really going to have to decide what you want to do from that point of view. But no matter what, the cables that you're looking at if you really want to make sure you get good shielded cables, buy from the reputable reseller. And if this is temporary, if you just need a quick solution, if you don't really care and you're just on a budget, sure, grab the cheap ones. Just have realistic expectations for them. Next up, Bamboo Shadow wants to know, about that Super GC Plus SNES to GameCube controller kit, is there any info or documentation about lag or input delay? So, excellent question. I'm always very happy to see people ask that. I'm pretty sure that it's built exact to spec of an original GameCube controller. So it would be the exact same as if you were using a completely stock GameCube controller. I also know the team who did it, who are absolutely crazy about lag, as uh, probably equal to or more so me. So they would never release a product with a lot of lag. But I do think that they should be posting about that. So I didn't go looking for that documentation, but if it's not on their webpage, I would really hope that they would put some kind of documentation and maybe even test results on there. Because if that especially is going to the Smash community, that's things they're going to want to see. So um, I am, you know, I would basically stake my reputation that this is not going to be a laggy controller just based on the people who made it. But I agree, there should be better documentation on the site about it. So I, as soon as I hit stop on this, I'm going to follow up with them. Next up, Oliver Clare wanted to talk a little bit about the Humble Bazooka Bluetooth adapters that were recently just restocked at Stone Age Gamer and the controllers to pair with them. 
When you have a situation like you have a Neo Geo CD, you get the Humble Bazooka adapter, then you could pick up a really cool 8-bit Doe controller that's essentially a wireless Neo Geo CD controller, and you could accomplish that with less than half a frame of latency. So that's pretty awesome. That's a really good and reliable Neo Geo CD solution. And with stuff like the Saturn, you could use the RetroBit ones, which do have more latency, but, you know, it's at least it's usable, and there's a lot of good RPGs on the Saturn. Maybe you're using those, and having a frame of latency isn't that big of a deal at all. But what about the 3DO and the Jaguar? What controllers would pair well with those? Because there aren't any faithful reproductions of those controllers. So this is all opinion based, right? Because uh, controllers are subjective. You know, I could hold a controller and say this is the most comfortable thing on the planet, and you could hold one and go, "This is shit." <laughs> so. My opinion is that the 3DO would pair well with really any six button controller. The Saturn, the Genesis one, uh, I think the Genesis Big Six, does that have triggers on it? I can't remember. I have it sitting right there. But if the Big Six has triggers, that would probably be a good one to use as well because most games are three buttons anyway. Um, so that one's, in my opinion, kind of an easier solution because the 3DO controller would really pair well with that. The Jaguar is interesting. Uh, and I think you would have to really figure out do you use Jaguar games with the overlays? There are only a handful of um, stock games that really used anything that was helpful. Um, and if not, if you use it in six button mode, would that accomplish the same thing? So if that's the case, then same as the 3DO, any six button controller would, you know, six button with triggers would probably be a perfectly good solution. But I don't know what you would do if you wanted to use the overlays and stuff as well. In that case, you might actually just want to get that aftermarket six button Jaguar controller and get an extension cable and not use wireless. Uh, that way you could have a true faithful to the original recreation of it. And, you know, hopefully you don't get because the Jaguar controllers are weird, too. There's a bunch of versions that people have complained about and said aren't good at all. And I think they're all equally meh. I never loved a Jaguar controller. I've had decent luck with them. So it really just depends. A lot of the experience for me with these original consoles is the controller. And there are some exceptions. I always prefer to use a Genesis 3 button controller on a Master System. If I'm playing Turbo Graphics or Game Boy on the Mister, I use the NES controller. So there's there's definitely there's you know, it's, this is room for interpretation. It's whatever you want to use, but you know, if I'm using a Genesis game that only has three buttons, I want to use that three button controller. You know, it just, it, I don't know why for me personally, it's always part of the experience. And there is some argument that that's what the developers were using to make these games. So that's what they were kind of holding and playing with as well. But it's totally up to you. There's no wrong answer to this other than using a super laggy controller to play a fighting game. Other than that, it's really up to you for preference. And that's just kind of my thoughts on the whole thing. Well, that's it for this time. If you're new to these Q&As, ask any question you'd like wherever it is that you support. Just please put the question in the newest Q&A post. The way these services work, I can't really figure out what's a new question on an older post. Plus, as you saw today, I like to just scroll through in real time and talk as if we were hanging out somewhere together. Today, all the questions were only on Patreon, but they're for wherever you support. It's just that there's a lot more supporters on that platform, so it's more likely to get questions there. But anywhere you support, put the questions uh, in that latest post. And if for whatever reason I miss it, it's probably just because the question came in after I was done recording. So just re-ask next week, or you could always DM me. And of course, and especially Thank you to everybody who supports, because it really is you who's keeping all of this stuff going. So thank you all so much, and I'll see you next week.